Episode 229 of the Bevan James Isles Show, Two Powerful Tools. Alrighty, team, welcome along to episode 229 of the Bevan James Oz Show, uh, your weekly, no, your fortnightly podcast on the behaviours that create a lifetime love of exercise so you can get all the benefits that come alongside it. Today, uh, I've got a bit of a Bevan show, which means I'm going to be talking about stuff that I want to be thinking about, want to share with you guys, and I've kind of got four things I want to talk about. In the main gist of the show, I'm going to have two big things, um, but there's two little things I want to talk about before I get into those. Um, one is... Some cool things I've heard recently. First of all, uh, there's, well, there's a patron on the show, Hayden. Hayden. Hayden's a runner of ours, and, and he said it really lovely. He just came up to me and said today as he was running, he ran past me because <laughs> he was doing the runners this morning. He just said, you know, how much this show helps and helps people. And, and thank you, Hayden, for telling me that because it really made my day. And it's just really nice when, you know, you, you do this type of work and you really hope that it does help people. And for Hayden just to give me that moment of kind of, love uh really meant a lot and so you know if, if you feel the same way about what Hayden told me I just really appreciate you know that who listens to the show gets value from the show because I'm all about that and then secondly I was speaking to another lady called Linda and Linda is um is a lady's training a half marathon got a really lovely lady and she had a funeral this week and she had a funeral with an auntie of hers who was that's she called her her special auntie and, and, and when she said that you kind of know what she means, eh? Like, you know, in life you have your relatives, but you then have that relative who is like the special relative to you. And, and maybe not necessarily your parents, but the, the relative who's really a big person in your life. And she said a funny thing. She said, the thing about my auntie was, I thought she was just, you know, the most special person to me. And then I went to a funeral and I realized she was that person for everybody in her life. That Everybody she connected with in her life was, you know, felt the same way about her auntie. And I just thought, could you get better praise? You know, like, and unfortunately her auntie's passed away and, and it was obviously a very sad time for Linda. Um, but, you know, if when I pass away, if people were to say, you know, Bevan's the guy who, who you know, made everyone's life better or you know, made everyone feel great... I mean, that's, that's success in life, isn't it? And and I'm sure Linda's told her auntie how much how important she was before she passed away. But I just love that statement because she said, she said it happened twice in her life. She's gone to a funeral where she felt this person was just such an amazing person, made her feel amazing and all the rest of it. And then she went to the funeral and, and both times that person or either both of those people, everyone at the funeral felt the same way about those people. And it's actually interesting. And I told her about, we lost one of our runners this year, a lady by the name of Bernadette. And Bernadette, this Indian lady always wore beautiful, bright clothes. Like just, you know, this beautiful Indian lady wore bright clothes with just this effervescence of life. And she was just a beautiful soul, brought greatness to everyone. And, and unfortunately, she had a pretty horrible battle of cancer and she passed away. And so we went to the funeral because she was one of our runners for a long time. And a bit like Linda's auntie, the, the funeral was just a celebration of life, a celebration of a beautiful person who made the world a better place and you know when we think about the measures in life to me that's a pretty cool measure that idea that in your funeral people would think about you in that way wow that's that's pretty awesome second thing i want to talk about before i get in the main just in today's show i was catching up with my, my good mate sean the other day and sean is a I talk about Sean a lot on the show. Sean know the porno, you know, you've probably heard me talk about him. Um, and Sean's a, Sean's a high achiever, you know, high achiever in many areas. And we catch up, we have these deep, deep and meaningful conversations. And one thing that Sean's very good at in life is he's very good at self-work. He, he, he spends a lot of time and energy on self-work, and uh, it's quite procedural. Uh, he'll give himself time, he'll put the commitment aside, there'll be books, you know, he, he's always this kind of pieces of paper he works for, and uh, he's very driven by that kind of evolution of him. And, and I'm kind of really proud of Sean, because I remember, I've kind of been a mate of his for a long time, and I remember earlier on, you know, when we were, this would be 10, 15 years ago, when he was in a career he wasn't really passionate about, he was high level in the career, like Sean's a doctor level of, of study, you know, he's got a doctor in, in his area of expertise, 
and he wanted to move into another area and he, you know, he said, I want to do this passionate life and now he isn't in this passionate life and in this last moment, he's kind of become the man in his area of passion. So his passion is this idea of procurement. Procurement is, you know, think of like a big organization buying stuff and big organization buying stuff is a big purchasing power and the thing he's really passionate about is using procurement to make the world a better place. An example is... Uh, one big organization in New Zealand, I can't remember what it was, they bought from an, another organization lots of their widget, whatever it was, and this organization helped disabled people have full-time work. Now, that's really good use of procurement. It's using procurement for social good or for environmental good. And this is Sean's passion. And, and when we go back to 15 years ago when we were talking about him you know, making that transition, that's what he wanted to do is this kind of procurement and sustainability and social good. And he's done all this work, and now he's kind of the man. He won an award at the end of last year. He, um, the government's approached him and they've kind of given this position, which is kind of about see what you can do, and, and kind of given this open slather, and, and he's just absolutely blitzing it. And we caught up the other day, and you know when somebody's thriving? You know when somebody's in their life and they're just absolutely thriving? And he's just, there's just an energy that comes from that person and, and I sat down with Sean and you could just see this guy is thriving and, and you know and, it's, and he, he shows me his pieces of paper and showed me his work he's done and you kind of we looked at his values and it was really interesting because he, he was just aligned with his values and I asked him a question around um, what were the conditions that made that took you to this place now Sean's a pretty high level guy anyway and most of the time he's obviously very high level but the level, the kind of thriving he's in right now is kind of even the next level on top of that. And one interesting thing that came through was some of the influences in his life have shifted and he's got some new influences in his life that he has 100% trust in and they have 100% trust in him. And suddenly, because he's got this sense of trust from the, the supporters he has and he trusts them as well, there's almost like this barrier that maybe he didn't have in the past, that's unleashed a higher level of thriving. Now, this is really interesting, and Sean's situation is an interesting one, but the thing I find interesting about it is, when we think about thriving environments, often we, there's the obvious things. It's, you know, that you're going through some growth, or that you're um, learning, or that you're uh, having an experience that's new to you, or that you feel stimulation from a person who's a good influence on you. You know, that thriving place, often the answers are really obvious. Whereas the, the thing that Sean and I came up with was, was probably wouldn't have been an obvious answer. You know, when you say to someone, what, what creates a thriving environment? We, you probably wouldn't necessarily say, Oh, having that sense of 100% trust from my support network and me trusting them, you know, that kind of two-way street thing, you wouldn't necessarily identify that as the answer. But it's really obvious in, in Sean's situation. That's one of the, Now, there's many reasons he's thriving. He's, he's passionate about the thing he's doing. He's in the right position. He's got opportunity. He's hardworking. It's aligned with his values, all the rest of it. But this was one of the other pieces of the puzzle. And I kind of I said to him, maybe one thing you could think about is, what are some of the other areas that you maybe you haven't identified that create thriving for you? And I just think this is a really good question for you to think about in your life. Like when you thrive, what are those obvious things that are in place? But also, maybe if you dig a little bit deeper, what are some of the factors that you don't see that actually could make you thrive? Because like with Sean, one thing we talked about is that Moving forward, he should always make sure that the conditions or the environment he moves into has that sense of trust in both directions because we know that gives him the ability to thrive. Whereas if he doesn't have that, he still might be able to succeed to a high level, but maybe not to the place he's in right now. And so a really good question to think about in your own life is what are the conditions that create thriving for me? And there will be those obvious answers that you've learned or that you will discover along the way. But then when you kind of step back a little bit further, Maybe what are the ones that aren't so obvious for you? And how do you make sure you can put those in place or learn what those are and then look to put those in place so you can spend more time in thriving? It's just a really, I just found, yeah, it was just a really cool conversation. I just thought it was a really good insight that I wanted to share with you guys. So that's, that's the kind of bit that I wanted to share before I even get into the main gist of today's show. But before I get into the main gist, 
I just want to say a big thank you to the patrons of the show. Uh, these are the people who support this show by giving some of their hard-earned money to it each time I release an episode. Uh, what, what happens is basically every time I release an episode, uh, I basically there's a process that takes the payment from you. And what you need to do if you want to support the show is you go to bevanjamesisles.com. You click on support the show or podcast, support the show, and it'll take you through to Patreon, and it'll set up that process. Once you've done that, you'll basically, every time I release a show, you'll just, you know, give some of your hard-earned money my way. And then also you get a cool Ben and James Old Show nickname. And these are some of the people who support the show. Libby, all in Hilda. We've got Rebecca, Bullseye, Spears. We've got Bernadette, Soul Caliber, Parry. We've got Matt, Forrest, Warhol, Ackhurst. And we've got Holly, the Go-Getter, Woodhouse. So if you enjoy the show, you want to support the show, just go to bevanjamesholes.com. Anyway, I'm going to get into the main gist of the show. If you've been hanging around me recently, <laughs> I guarantee you've heard about the book Chatter. I may, I think I may have even talked about it on the, the last interview, um, and if I didn't, well, I'm sorry, but I'm going to talk about it right now. So I was listening to another podcast I like recently, and they were talking about, um, they one of the one of the posts is just a prolific reader, and he reads a lot, and he'll, he'll often give recommendations, and some of them, you know, he's quite honest about the value of the book, and he talked about this book Chatter, and he just said, this is a mind-blowing read, and so I thought, oh, I'd better get it. So I went and got it, I read it. It's a, it's a pretty quick read, I think I read it in about three nights, um, and I have to agree with this host mind-blowing book so the basic premise of the book is by a guy called ethan cross and i've tried to get him on the show he's a bit busy right now i might try to get him on later on in the year so fingers crossed i can get him on the show but the basic premise of the book it's about the voice in your head and it, the voice in your head and how you manage that better and the basic premise is he talks about this idea of rumination so rumination is that place where something's owning the voice in your head in a way that's consuming and not necessarily a good way in your life so it might be you've been treated unfairly it might be you're concerned about something it might be an insecurity a vulnerability whatever and he talks about when you're in your voice in your head that language you use within the voice tends to be immersive language now immersive language is what we call things like i me so i've been treated fear unfairly in a situation um i struggle here this is unfair on me um i think i'm going to fail in this you know, how am I going to get through this? So you can see those that kind of language is the, the internal dialogue you're having at that time. Now, Ethan talks about the best way to get away from immersive rumination is to create distance. Now, in the book, he gives some techniques around doing this. So one of the ways to create distance, and again, we're talking about the voice in your head here, but one of the ways to create distance is time traveling. So time traveling is that thing of, if I were to look back on this situation three months from now, how would I see it? Now you can see as soon as you say that, it creates distance from I'm being treated unfairly right now or I feel vulnerable about this moment. So when you when you create that distance of the time traveling, that can help. Another way is to uh, do another person's perspective. So it might be if I were to, if my mentor were to look at this situation, what would they do? So he, he offers different techniques in the book. But one of the techniques which I, I may, I'm, I'm actually feeling maybe one of the most powerful techniques I've learned in the last period of my life. Like, you know me, you listen to the show, I'm always trying to find ways to evolve and, and develop myself. And this one here, mind blown. So he talks about using third person or second or third person voice. Now I've got to be honest, the way I've been doing it is just a lot of third person voice. I haven't done a lot of second person. So, so second person is, you've got this in this situation. You know, you know how to handle this, you know. Third person voices, Bevan's in a situation right now where he's struggling, but he needs to focus on this thing here. So uh, it's almost like I, I, I talked to somebody else about it and they said, oh, so it's like you've got a commentator talking about you in this situation. And that's a really good way of thinking about it. So the idea is, you, you first thing is to catch that you're ruminating. So catch when your voice in your head is holding on something that's absolutely, absolutely consuming you. 
And the way I often describe this is that kind of rewind play, rewind play. You know when you've got something in your head and you just keep rewinding and playing it. And it's like when you rewind and play it, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. So when we think about that, what we want to do is create distance. Now you can use other techniques. So he also talks about things like being in nature. Obviously techniques like meditation and exercise and those types of things create distance. But today I just want to focus on this third person technique. So what the first thing you want to do, at least this is my experience of it. Now I do recommend you get the book and I do talk a lot about the things in the book today. So, um, But I still recommend you get the book. So what the first thing is, Actually, I'm going to take a step back here. So one thing he talks about in the book, which I find really quite interesting, is we live in a world today where it says, if you've got a problem, talk to somebody about it. And he, it, the research shows that can actually be a really disastrous strategy when we think about removing ourselves from immersive rumination. So again, that's self-talk that we're kind of consumed by. And the reason is, if we choose the wrong person and they just reinforce the place you're in, it doesn't actually move you forward. Actually, what it tends to do is it takes you back. So, you, you you know, you might have had something that happened to you two months ago and you talk to the wrong person and they actually just take you back to that place. So you leave that conversation just feeling that immersive rumination. And what he talks about is you do need to be able to, expression is a great way to create distance if you choose the right person. And really in choosing the right person, you want someone who has highly skilled communication skills, but also the ability to help you move towards a strategy and a plan moving forward. So when we think about that, you're in immersive rumination, talking it out is a good thing to do if you choose the right person. And when we think about that, why that's important, well, first of all, what's that person doing? Well, what that person's doing is helping you create distance they're helping you to see the real problem you need to solve and they're helping you move towards or create the solving that you need to do. Now, what I'm finding is the third person voice has the ability to achieve the same thing. So I read this and I'm going to share a couple of examples. So last week I was in Auckland. I do these filming for Les Mills and, and Les Mills is a, like the filming I go into, it is high, high production. I go into this massive warehouse. They've got screens. That, think of screens at a rugby game, like that big, in both directions. You know, the sets, they, I'd hate to think what they spend on the sets. We've got a film crew, six films on the on the dollies, on the on the booms, on the on the rain, train tracks. You know, this is high level production. And I haven't done a filming for about two years because I had my back operation last year and this is my first time back since my back operation. So it's been about probably 18 months to two years. Actually, it's been two years. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much been two years since I've done a filming. And in my last filming, the first half of the filming, I had a real immersive ruminating experience. So I'm teaching this film to this high prediction. This is like two years ago. And in my head, for some reason, I was in a really vulnerable, insecure place. So I went to that place of, you're not what you used to be, um, you know, very self-aware of everything I was doing. I was, you know, my, my, my talk inside my head was, don't make a mistake, you, you know, you can't make a mistake. It was all this kind of place. Now, in that experience two years ago, at about halfway through the filming class, a switch happened and I went, Iles, you're all right, move on. Interestingly, how I commented there, I went, oh, was your right? So I did even do person voice here, didn't I? So within that, this time, it's been two years. You know, like I'm 44 in this game. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm at the last part. And I, if I'm going to go on those filmings, I'm always going to respect it. I'm going to turn up in peak condition. I'm going to do all the work possible. I'm going to make sure that my quality of work is never dropped. Because if my quality of work drops, I can't do the filming. You know, and that's in my mind because it's A, it's I'm setting a standard for a lot of instructors around the world. B, I'm representing something that's really important to me. And C, my own personal integrity. So you, you could think that two years later, back operation, that I could head up to Auckland and be in a place which, like I experienced a couple of years ago in that first half, that, that could be the experience again. So you, you have five or six days in Auckland practicing like crazy. So I do all the prep and, and I do the work so the prep's ready. You go into this production, like think of a big like factory warehouse. That's how big this room is. It's like a huge factory warehouse. So the film crews all set up. You get in there and you kind of instantly feel pressure. You know, in my career, 
this is my most pressure moment I feel because you walk in this room there's a lot writing on it you've got to deliver you, you get together you, you know you kind of got an hour you get together with your team you go over everything with the team and then you kind of get like 20 minutes before you start and it's kind of like a, a, you know think of like a rugby player or a, or a you know a netball player or some sports player kind of in the changing rooms before they walk out it's that 20 minutes before and as I'm getting to that 20 minutes before, I feel a bit of immersiveness coming in, that immersive rumination. Have I, have, I, have I still got it? Am I going to be okay? You know, what if I make a mistake? Listen to my language here. I, what if I, have I still got it? It's all, it's all about immersive me. I caught myself. I thought, oh, okay, this is a moment where you need to use third person voice. So within myself, I started doing the commentator. And and what what's really important around when I'm been doing the third person voice is like you would with the conversation is I'm really trying to see the real thing I'm trying to work on. I'm really trying to understand the root cause problem that I have right now. So I go to commentator voice and I go, Bevan's feeling pressure right now because this is a really important moment in his career. He's got to make sure he delivers and he wants to make sure he delivers at a high standard. So that, you know, I'm really seeing the situation that I'm in right now. And then the commentator goes towards problem solving. But the thing about Bevan is he always does the work. So he knows he can trust that he's done the work right now. And he also has 20 years of experience in doing this. So he knows that once he gets on there, he knows how to be successful. And he also knows that he can mentally prepare to deliver on the day. Now you can see what's happened there, can't you? You can see that commentator voice in my head has created distance from that internal voice, which was, have I still got it? Am I in a place where, you know, will I fail? And so on. Now, what was really interesting, did that 20 minutes going over my stuff, got on stage, and I think I maybe have done the best job I've ever done. Now, I can't say that's true because I haven't seen the finished product. And sometimes what you feel isn't necessarily represented in the finished product. I have got feedback from um, Lisa, Lisa Osborne, to say that it looked amazing. We did a really great job. So that's really encouraging. But at least my inner experience was I was in total control. You know, like I was, once I was on stage, or once I, we wouldn't have a stage, we're just on a big concrete floor. But once, I was, once the filming was going, I just had trust. You know how I talked about that first, last time, it was like halfway, your first half was all over the place and then eventually I found trust. I walked up and not, not a cocky, arrogant trust, I just, I just had it. And I delivered. You know, I delivered to the standard that I wanted to make sure I delivered to. That would be respectful to the, to the, the situation, to the people I'm meant to be a, a role model for and for my own personal credibility. Now, this tool, this third-person voice tool, is in the book, he talks a lot around the rumination, the immersive rumination. But I've expanded it into pretty much all areas of my life. And I'm going to show you another couple of quick examples. So our car blew up recently. Now, I'm not a car person at all. Like, seriously, I just don't care about cars. I'm, I'm you know, like in my 20s, I didn't even have a car. And then I went out with my girlfriend, Annalise. She had a $400 car she bought. It was an old, seriously, this car was an old boy racer car. It had the big exhaust. It was lowered. It was a, it was a total bomb of a car. And, and I drove it for like two years. I didn't give a crap. If you, if you judge me on my car, I just, whatever. But our car blew up. And we're in a position in, my, in this moment in our life where, we can afford a nicer car. And we're also stupidly in our house. We've got a house where we're on a hill. And when they designed the driveway, we, we couldn't get our car down the driveway because the lip of the of the corner going over and down into the driveway is too steep. So our old car we never actually put in the driveway. So we we end up getting we end up looking for cars, and there's basically two options. One was like a Honda, and in New Zealand, a Honda is kind of your typical Japanese car. And one was a V-Dub. Now, V-Dubs, you know, if you listen to this in Europe, V-Dub's just another car. But in New Zealand, V-Dubs, European cars tend to have a, a bit more of a prestige. So we get the Honda. It scrapes the driveway so we can't get it. So we've got to have this one option for a car. But I have to admit, it's a really nice car. You know, and, and it, you know, it's really nice. And I was at the gym the other day. And I'm walking to my car. And there's a guy called Johnny. Johnny's a really nice guy. He's, he's ran with us for a while. Um... Him and Deb, just a beautiful couple and just really lovely people. And Johnny's walking out towards his car. Now, we weren't even close. I think he's like 50 metres away from me. And I just give him a wave and I kind of open my car. 
And I had that material ego hit. You know the material ego hit? is that ego hit of, I feel, you know, they probably think I'm a little bit better because I've got this car. Now, the car's not that great. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like it's a nice car. It ain't, it ain't a Ferrari. But, you know, going from my old car to this car, it was a step up. And so I had that moment where I felt a better version of myself. Or I felt he might be impressed by me because of a thing I owned. Now, I don't care about cars. And also, I don't want to be a person in life who gets, who chases getting value from material things. I don't want to be that. And in that moment, I caught that. I caught, I'm getting value from some, something that's actually just not that important in my life. You're like, you know, and I get, if you love cars, like if you're a car person and you, you know, that's, that's a different piece, but I'm not. So in that moment, I went to a third person talk. I said, Bevan's in a moment right now where he's rewarding for himself for something that's actually not that important. Best use of his energy is to just be focused on the now and put some music on and just be in the presence. Now, in that moment, that thought that I had a moment before just totally disappeared. And that's, that's not a rumination thing, was it? That wasn't me worried about something. That was me actually taking, getting too much praise for something that actually wasn't that important. Actually, I heard, just on that, I heard a really good question the other day around, um, around material things. It said, would you buy it if no one could know you bought it? That's a really interesting question, eh? Would you buy it if no one knew you could, you know, and you bought it? Totally left field there, but I just thought that was a good question. So, so I use it in that situation there. Now I'm using it, like even before this podcast, I was watching, you know, I had five minutes before I started this podcast and I jumped on YouTube for a second and I was watching a clip and it actually wasn't that important. And I said, Bevan's wasting time right now and we should just do the job. And as soon as I said that, bang, went off. Now I'm finding this as a tool I'm using a lot in my life. And the way I'm using this tool, which and I find it so powerful, is catching when there's a problem to solve. Okay, example. The other day I was at the gym doing leg press, and leg press is a hard weight to do. And one of the things a lot of people do in like a leg press machine when it gets hard is they decrease their range of motion. So Let's say when I'm doing a leg press well, I'll get my knees to my chest and then push out. And when it's getting really heavy and mentally I'm getting a little bit weak, what I'll do is maybe just won't go so deep. So in that moment, I just thought to myself, I, I caught that I was doing it. So I went to third person voice. What's the problem Bevan's trying to solve right now? Okay, Bevan in this moment is looking for an easier way out of a tough challenge. Ideally what he wants to do is he wants to brace and learn how he can push through and make sure he's got the range to get the results that he desires. Now, got that in my head, did the leg press, knees hit the chest every time. And this is what you want to think about is A, what's the, what's the problem or what's the thing that needs to have a solution here right now? And then how do I identify that in a third person voice? And, and think about that commentator. Think about that commentator voice that, that, that one of my clients mentioned to me. Then from there, what's the way forward? So what's the way forward with this? You know, like uh, for me, it was in the car. Once I thought that with Johnny looking at me, I thought to myself, um, you know, the way forward is just to be present. So I put on a cool song and, you know, just felt present with the music. For me, body attack, it was to reinforce that I have history, I've done the work, you know, all those types of things. For me, before this podcast, it was turn off the video, go do your work. And I'm the thing I'm finding about this, which I'm finding... The most powerful thing of all, like I'm, I'm someone who doesn't lack confidence. I'm, I'm not someone who's, like I, I, I have inner confidence. But this tool is giving me a higher level of trust in myself. Because I'm finding I'm not afraid of situations as much as I was in the past. I'm going to say it again because it's kind of important. I'm not afraid of situations as much as I was in the past. And some of those situations are the bigger things like the filming. Some of them are just procrastination. Some of them are wrong ego areas. Um, some of them are hard conversations. Creating the distance by using third-person voice has given me a higher level of trust, which almost gives me more optimism when I look to my future. And that's why I'm finding this such a powerful tool. Because when you go... when Now... You might come back to me and say, Bevan, totally didn't work for me. Although, interestingly, I, I've, again, as I said at the beginning of this podcast, 
<laughs> if you've hung around me in the last two weeks, you've heard about this book. And one of our runners, one of one of our runners called Tim. Tim's this lovely man who's achieved amazing success. Like I think Tim was like 140 kg. He's down like to 80 kg now. He um he he hadn't done exercise in years. He's now an athlete. And what I mean by that, he's chasing fast time. He's mentally tough. He's I mean, he's an athlete. And uh, he was having a tough day today. He I think he was doing some work around the house and kind of tweaked his back a little bit. And after I, he didn't tell me this, he was talking to Joe, and he said, oh, "I was using Bevan's technique today, and um, I was in a place where I was feeling a bit crap because my back was a bit sore, and I wasn't even a good run. And I went to third person voice, and I said, you know, Tim, how would Tim feel about this? The earlier version of him from six months ago feel about this right now? Now, six months ago, Tim was still in the beginning of his exercise journey, whereas now he's an athlete, and the earlier version of him would have felt amazing about this. So it allowed him to accept the situation and put his focus on what he could do, and." That's what we want to think about. So what I want you to do is I want you to practice this. I Ideally, that's what I want you to do. I want you to practice this. And what I want you to do around practicing this is I want you to practice third-person voice as much as possible over the next couple of weeks. And really what you go, the process I want you to think is catch, particularly when you're ruminating, but catch any moment when there's a problem to solve. Go to the commentator. And the commentator is trying to identify the real thing. And, and ideally what we want to do is go to that deeper root. We want to go really into the deeper root of it. You know, what's the real core thing I'm trying to solve here? And then once you've identified that real core thing, what's the way through it? And then see what happens. And as I've said, or at least as I've experienced, do it as much as possible. Because, I don't know, if, if it has half the effect it's had on, on me for you, I think you're going to be you're going to find it's a really powerful tool. Now, in the book, I, I got you know I do want you to get his book because you know obviously I've, I've taken a lot of ideas from his book and I do recommend it. And um, it's one of those books which I bought and studied. Like I, I sometimes I buy audio books and then buy the or, um, the print or the Kindle version. Uh, this one here I actually bought the Kindle first, but I just like studied this book. Um, in the book, he has got other techniques, and and so I recommend when we go back to just creating distance. I recommend you go and you know read read the book for that reason because um, it is really quite phenomenal. So I have got another thing I want to talk about today, and I won't go for long because we're already up to like thirty two minutes. But just to recap on that, sometimes when we have situations where we're ruminating, we use immersive self talk. That's the me and the I. The best way to move away from that internal dialogue within our head is to create distance, and there's many ways to do that. The way I've talked a lot about today is the third person voice. And what we're looking to do with the third person voice is catch, commentate on what you're experiencing, and looking for the real problem that you need to face. Then once you've done that, dealing with it by finding the best solution, still using the commentating voice, and ideally acting upon that. You can use it with rumination, but I also encourage you just to use it in many other ways as possible. I'll be fascinated to see. Let me know. Flip me an email. Let me know what you think of this technique. Because, again, as I said before, if it has half the effect it has on my, my life for you, I think you're in for a bit of a treat. Now, the second thing I want to talk about in today's show, and this is this won't take so long, but it's, it's an interesting one. So, one of the things a coach will do, especially, let's say, like a running coach, so one of the things I will do when someone I've trained someone for like a marathon is after I've done the marathon, we always do a post-race reflection. And why would, why would we do that? Well, there's learning, isn't there? You know, after a race, you can learn what you've done well. You can look for areas where you didn't do so well. You can look for evolution. Um, you can give yourself some praise. You know, there's real value at stopping and going, you know what? How do I do well? Where can I improve? Where's my evolution? Where's my high fives? You know, that, that, that makes sense. Eh? Like, that's so clear. And when you think about a lot of times in your life where you've made a lot of progress, it's often come from some post-reflection. That after the fact, you sat back and you did some reflection. Now, I'm, I'm a big user of reflection. Like, you know, I, every Sunday I do my weekly meeting. And my weekly meeting is kind of like a 30 to 40 minute process. And, and in it, I look at my goals. I look at my, who am I? I, um, I'm just pulling it up right now, actually, I'm, going, I'm pulling up my weekly meetings I'm talking to you. So, you know, I, I, I look at the areas I'm, I'm trying to achieve goals in, I set objectives for the week. Um, but the first thing I do as a part of my weekly meeting is I just go, how did I do this week? So, you know, like I always write down a comment and literally it's, you know, here, here's the couple weeks, it goes, uh, 
this is another good week. I'm in a holding pattern and just getting over the line with a few projects. The next couple of weeks is about just getting through and then I'll be back to pushing hard to get the book and the band projects finished. This week I did a good job with the time I had. Okay, that's a pretty basic post-reflection. So what I do is, before I even start doing the planning of the next week, I just kind of do a reflection of the week. Sometimes it's a bit more detailed, sometimes it's a bit more specific, but you know, it's kind of that type of thing. Well, I've been thinking about this recently. And then, because then, so my process is have my weekly meeting, set objectives. So, like for example, for band this week, I'll be doing my weekly meeting tomorrow. It was to practice playing live and, and perform well, to push the recording to be finished, uh, and to do a little bit of work on the website. For my business, is to upskill my coaches, um, get my ads ready. For my training was to find a new strength program because I've done my one long enough or write a new strength program. Uh, for my book was to do some audiobook work and find um, someone to do the website uh, and so on. So, you know, these are my objectives. So this week, and that, that was music, that was business, that was training, that was book, investing in Joe friends. And one other one that I have is personal. Um, you know, so it's just a little thing that I need to work on within myself. So this week I've been working on better transitions, not letting an hour turn into an hour 10 for lunch, for example. So tomorrow when I sit down doing my weekly meeting, I'll just do an assessment of how I did well in those areas. And maybe what I'll do is I'll go, what I do well, where can I improve? And then my, my, my next step in my process is I have my morning meeting. So in the morning I, I read over my Bevan book, I look at my objectives for the week, I look at my planning on my calendar, and then I write down the objectives for today. How do I want to use today? And then what I do is as I work through the day, each time I start a new task, I look at the objective for that. So I don't just write down today, you want to do some, um, let's just say, you know, for the audio book, you, you know, I just write, I don't go book work. I say, okay, you want to spend 15 minutes of recording the audio book. Let's just say that's the objective. So then when I sit down to do the objective of the audio book work, I look at my objective, I put my focus into it, and that's what I spend my time doing. Now, as much as I say I do all this stuff, it's really important to say that I don't always get it right. You know, you know, these are really important tools, but I'm far from perfect. And there's days where, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't nail this stuff, but I do find this framework keeps me at a high level place more often. You can see how this is real high, you know, trying to keep me at a high level focus. The one thing I haven't done, and I've started doing, which I'm finding really powerful, is at the end of the period of time, and now, now we're looking at the day. So, you know, let's, let's, let's look at my... I bought my calendar for this week. So let's look at my week coming up on, here we go, I'm putting my calendar. On Tuesday, I've got a bit of work. I'm going to plan to do some planning around my audio book. Um, I've got to do a bit of upskilling for one of my coaches. And I've got to do some practice for my lap band stuff. Okay, th th those are some objectives. So when I get to Tuesday morning, I'll sit down, I'll look at my calendar, I'll look at my objectives, and I'll write these things down. Then when I get to the time to do them, I'll remind myself of the objectives, which gives me the focus. But one thing I've started doing recently is that at the end of the time, I give myself a minute to do a post-reflection on how I've used that time. So let's say I was meant to do an hour on piano, and I was focusing on, because I played live last night, and... I'm, I'm getting much better at being an expressive musician, but I still haven't got on top of heightened awareness, nervousness. Um, now, that third-person voice is probably something I need to work on there, but, you know, when you go you know, when you go in front of people, you feel heightened awareness. And I don't make it, uh, I'm probably making 10 to 15% of mistakes. Now, they're not major mistakes. When I listened to a recording last night, so I watched a video from last night, you know, you probably noticed three or four mistakes in the whole hour that we played, but it's something I want to get on top of. And so one of my objectives when I sit down to play piano on Tuesday will be trying to create a heightened awareness feeling and then sitting and practicing in that heightened awareness state. Now I have to think about how I'm going to do that. But then at the end of the hour, what I'm getting into the habit of doing is spending a minute or two just going, okay, what did I do well in that hour? Where can I improve on that hour? And what do I want to be aware of as I move into the next session that I'm going to do? Three simple questions. What do I do well? Where can I improve? And what do I want to focus on next time? It's not a beat yourself up thing. And, and seriously, it's literally a minute. And what I'm doing is as I transition between each task in my day, I do that. So as I've trained, what did you do well? Where can you improve? And what do you want to focus on next time? 
when I do my piano, when I do my business work, when I'm going to interact with somebody. Now, when we think about the marathon, that's an obvious thing to do, isn't it? After that big thing. And even when you think about me doing my weekly meeting, you know, the, the post-week reflection is a good thing to do. But to do it on such a, a narrow scale is not something I've ever thought about. And, you know, I'm sure somebody else in the world has. But again, when we think about evolution, one of the feedback is one of the, you know, feedback, personal feedback or even external feedback is one of the greatest ways to fast forward your progress. And to me, that post moment reflection is proving to be really valuable because it's helping me see, ah, oh, okay, this is where I'm getting, this is what I need to focus on. So then when I get to the next session on the keyboard, I'll know what the next thing I need to focus on. So I just wanted to share that with you. Now, you can take from this what you want, but if you want to give it a try, ideally what I want to think about is just in the blocks of time that you have in your day when you're doing a task, a good idea is first of all set objectives as you're going into the task, but then as you're leaving the task, just ask those three questions. What do I do well? Where can I improve? What am I going to focus on next time? Seriously. When you're driving home from the gym after a workout, when you when you finish a task at work, when you finish a meeting, when you've connected with your family members, when you've gone out socially, whatever. Give it a try. Um, I'm finding, you know, we, we you know, how do we fast forward evolution? That's an interesting question, eh? How do you fast forward evolution? And reflection is a really good way, and feedback's a really good way, isn't it? You know? And if we can do more of that, does it fast forward even more? Now, I'm, I've been doing this for like a week, so I can't really give you that much progress report on it, but it feels like it's making a difference in quite a big way. So, yeah, I, I kind of give it a try. Now, what I want you to do is, is write me a message. Let me know how you got along, um, either in the third person or the post-activity reflection you know, make that habit and see what happens because I think both today, I think today's tools are quite powerful. I know the third person one is, is to me a bit life changing. Like I can, and I, I don't think I'm overstating that. I, I feel that for me, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's powerful. And even the post moment reflection, I think has the potential to be quite powerful as well. So hopefully taking a lot away from that today because yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. Anyway, uh, what do I always say here? If you do these things, you'll become a higher version of yourself. All right, team, hopefully you enjoyed that part of the show. Uh, yeah, practice, 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 practice. All tools work if you practice them. Well, not all tools work, but most you know, tools that do work use them and practice them. Uh, one thing I do want to say is, uh, it's, it's getting, um, every time I do an episode right now, we promote my get my book ready for promotion. Um, and one thing, if you want to check out the cover, the cover has finally been done. You can go to my Instagram, Bevan James, just look at Bevan James Isles. It's E-Y-L-E-S, or you see the show anyway. Um, and, or on my, my personal Facebook page, I put a photo up there the other day and begin a really good feedback on it, which is really exciting. Um, the book goes to the printer. June looks like it's going to be the date, so it's pretty exciting. I, as I said a couple of episodes ago, I, I need you to promote this because I want to get the first kick. You know, I want I want the first bit, you know, to go really well because what I'm doing with this book is, I think I've said this in the last episode, every book I sell, I'm just going to buy ads. Like seriously, every book I sell, I'm just buying ads. So if I can make $10 off a book, you know what I'm doing? I'm buying ads to get more people to buy the book because I believe this book can help people love exercise. Like seriously, I believe it can. And if, 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 if the book sells well and I can buy more ads and I can get more reach, well, well and, and if the book works, and I do think the book, like I've, <laughs> I've read the book probably 10 times now and, I, and I've got the last proof back. So literally before today, before today's episode, I read the book for about two hours. So, um, you know, I've, I've read the book more than anyone probably, probably all ever read the book. Um, but as I read it, I think, you know, I think I've got it right. And if I've written a book that can help non-exercisers love exercise, man, that will be, that's my life's work. You know, that, that's so cool. But I, but I need your help. I really need your help. And when it comes out, if you've ever listened to this, this show in the past, Chuck, buy the book. You know, like, it's probably going to cost about $35 New Zealand, something somewhere in that price range. Um... Buy the book, and if you're already an exerciser, buy it and give it to somebody else. Or if you can't afford it, send the website to somebody, because 
if, if we can get people buying this book again we're just gonna buy ads to buy more people to buy the book so um yeah so get ready like, what, in your head right now y'all want you to say yep Bevan, i'm going to support you that's what I want. you know like I, I you know with this podcast you know i say become a patron and, and i'll be honest not many people do you know it's probably some one percent of the listeners to, it'd be well less it's probably 0.01 percent of the listeners who actually become patrons and those who are patrons you're bloody rock stars and i really appreciate it but i've never really asked much from this podcast and i've never put advertisers on because i just never really wanted to i don't want this to you know just i just keep that separated because i just want to give with this show um and i've never really asked a lot you know but the book is something I'm going to ask from you and, and I'm going to ask you to buy it and I'm going to ask you to, to send the link to your friends and um, if you've ever got value from this podcast, pl- please support this book because if this book can be the influence I want it to be, you supporting it can actually get more people moving and if we can get more people moving, the world's going to be a healthier place, not just physically, but mentally and also, like, it's that flow on effect, eh? You know, if you help somebody love exercise, what does it mean for their kids? What does it mean for the other people in their world? And what's the flow and effect for the long term? So a little thing of like recommending this book to someone who's not exercising, and if they fell in love with exercise, how cool is that? So, yeah, again, I I don't ask much, but I am going to ask you to promote the crap out of this book. And and I'll I'll, I'll I'll give you ways to do it when the book comes out, but I'm I'm feeding your mind. I'm feeding. Mind. So again, subconsciously tell yourself, yeah, I'm going to support Bev with this. Uh, if you do want to become a patron of the show, go to bevanjamesowls.com, go to podcast, go to support me. Appreciate the support you guys give me. You, if you're a patron, you're a bloody rock star. Absolutely love it. I'm going to be back in a couple of weeks from now. I'll get an interview for you guys. Um, yeah, as I always finish the show, I say, keep being you. Keep being you.